My name is Alexandra Reininger, but I go by Alex, and I am the Pathways Intern for the Marine Turtle Biology and Assessment Program under the Protected Species Division at NOAA. And today, I will be talking to you about life as a field biologist in French frigate shoals. And I just want to mention, I want to make this really interactive, so if you guys have questions at any time, please raise your hand, and I'll try to stop what I'm talking about and get right to your question. So, and I'm going to be asking you guys questions as well. So a little bit about me. I was born and raised in a small town in Oregon that was landlocked, but I grew up loving the ocean and I always wanted to move somewhere where I could be able to scuba dive all the time. So I thought I would move to Hawaii and start school at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Since then, I have been continuing to scuba dive and I'm an avid diver and I also have a fondness for turtles. So I joined a program called the Marine Option Program. It is a certificate program at the University of Hawaii, and they have multiple um, different programs at different campuses. And through this program, I got um, hired as a student stranding associate um, for marine turtle stranding. So through this position, I got hands-on work involving um, picking up of dead, sick, injured, and or tumor turtles. And then I would bring them back to our facility for either rehab or uh, necropsies. And I was in this position for about two years. And then I got hired on as a field researcher. And I was able to go up to this remote atoll and perform nesting surveys for approximately five months. And so when I returned from this, I um, began work as um, a stranding associate again. And then I applied to become a pathways intern. So that is my current position. So this allows me to work closely with colleagues at NOAA and um, perform my own research projects. So this is the Marine Turtle Biology and Assessment Program. And I do want to point out that we have two of our members in the back. We have Todd and Cam here. Todd is our lead and Cam is a great scientist as well. And so we have um, so many different interests within our pro program. It's really cool. And we focus on um, marine turtles within the Pacific Islands region. But today I'm going to be focus focusing on turtles within Hawaii. So how many species of marine turtles can be found within Hawaiian waters? Does anybody know? Yeah? Five? five. You're right. You guys can just uh, yell them out if you know any species. Mm -hmm. Hawksbills. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Greens. We got two. We got three more. Leatherback. Leatherback, yes. Loggerheads. Yeah, loggerheads. And it's one of the Ridleys. All of Ridley's, yes. So those last three are mostly pelagic species, so we don't see them in these near shore environments. Um, so here we have the five different species. What do you mean by pelagic species? Pelagic. So they inhabit deeper waters, and they don't usually come to shore unless it's for nesting. Um, so females would come to shore for nesting or if they're stranded. So sometimes here in the Hawaiian Islands, we will see stranded uh, all of Ridley's or... Um, Loggerheads and leatherbacks are more rare, but it is possible. So I kind of gave this away already, but what two species? Hawksbills and greens can be found in near shore environments. Uh, so the green is the more common species that we see around the Hawaiian Islands, and hawksbills are, uh, hawksbills are more rare, and they are critically endangered. Sam does some field work, and part of this field work involves nesting. So we do some nesting work in Rose Atoll in American Samoa, and we also do nesting work in French Frigate Shoals, which I'll be focusing on later, as well as hawksbill nesting on Hawaii Island, Molokai, and Maui. So the Hawaiian green sea turtle was, um, the population was rapidly declining in the 70s with the harvesting of the eggs and the carcass for human consumption. But this uh, protection for the species occurred in 1973, and then finally in 1978, they were listed as threatened, and their population began to increase at 6% a year. So green sea turtles that reside in the main Hawaiian islands, as well as sea turtles that reside in the northwestern Hawaiian islands, the majority of them migrate to the small atoll known as French frigate shoals. And this is where 96% of green sea turtle nesting occurs. So French frigate shoals is a 20 mile long coral reef atoll that includes eight sandy islands. However, the majority of nesting occurs on only two of these islands, Turn Island and East Island. So if we take a closer look at these islands, Turn Island in the atoll 
and has approximately 45% of nesting. And East Island is the second largest island in the atoll, but is significantly smaller than Turin Island. And this is where the majority of nesting occurs. So in the 1970s, researchers with the Hawaii Institute of Ecology and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service began performing surveys um, during the nesting season. And back in the 70s, their camp was very small. They had the necessities, just food, water, a camp, and some surveying equipment. So camp starts to improve as we get into the 80s. As you can see, <laughs> still not a very luxurious life. <coughs> And every, every year, um, researchers will go up to these islands and survey and count the number of nesting female turtles. So camp begins to improve. And then beginning in the 80s, we actually had researchers with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration as well collaborative, collaboratively work and survey. So I went up in the 2017 season as a field researcher. And these are my other two colleagues, Mary Lou on the left and Jan Whitlam in the middle. And we were the three researchers for that season. Before we went up there, though, we had to go through a series of trainings. So one of the trainings we went through was the uh, Motorboat Operator Certification Course, also known as MOCC. During this course, we got to work behind the helm of a boat. We also learned some fire safety and um, charting, as well as knot tying. So this was a about a week-long course, and we got to learn all the, all the necessities that we would need for daily life in the atoll because we would be traveling between the islands um, on boat. We also practiced surveying techniques. So we went up to the North Shore of Hawaii, uh, Oahu for a day and we practiced tagging of green turtles as well as measuring. And um, this was a really good way for us to practice these techniques that we'd be doing every single day in the atoll. We also went through the National Outdoor Leadership School Wilderness Training, and this involved um, a series of wound treatments and preventive, preventative measures, and our favorite was the administering of an IV on each other. So the three of us worked in those top pictures. You can see we're actually administering IV, um, and I think, I think we all felt that we could help each other in the, um, if there was ever an emergency. We also had to pack lots of gear because we're deploying for about five months and we have to bring all of our gear with us because we will not be traveling back and forth within that nesting season. So we packed hundreds of these blue water jugs as well as lots of first aid equipment. And you can see Wilson there, <laughs> um, if any of you guys know about Castaway. <laughs> and we also packed lots of um, technological equipment that helped us with our surveys. And in that picture on the left, you can see we have four satellite tags that we deployed on turtles. And I'll show you some pictures of those later. And those provide very great data of migration patterns for green turtles. In the middle, you can see how we packaged up all of our gear. So we packaged all of our equipment in these yellow buckets. And we had to go through very strict quarantining procedures as well. So all soft materials like clothes, um, hats had to be frozen for approximately three days and then um, other gear was fumigated. So we don't wanna bring up pests into the atoll because there's species up there that are very delicate and we don't wanna bring up things such as ants or roaches, spiders, um, invasive plants. Um, yeah, many invasive species such as those. And then the right you can see sample storage doers, which we stored lots of um, skin samples or other um, biological samples in and those contain them until we could come back to Oahu. So, um, yes, you know, I'm not very familiar with them. I know Cam is very familiar with them. So they do contain liquid nitrogen. Yeah, so um, you do have to be careful with those, especially in uh, transferring onto the ship. So we departed in May. And the picture on the left, you can see the French Frigate Shoals team. So four of those researchers were going up there to study the Hawaiian monk seal. And then three of us were going to study the Hawaiian green sea turtle. And the picture on the top right, you can see all of our water jugs that we had to fill. And you've got to remember, those things are very heavy, and we're lugging, lugging those around by hand. And then we departed on the Oscar Elton Seti. So our trip up to uh, French Frigate Shoals is about a week long. And during that time, we practiced uh, donning our immersion suits or Gumby suits. That is me in the Gumby suit on the right. And then my um, colleague, Jan Willem, looking off the ship at Nihoa as we're approaching. 
So we got to see many different rocky pinnacles and other um, small islands on our way up there. So upon arrival, we unpack all of our gear off the ship and we bring it onto the island. So we brought all of our gear onto Turn Island first because there's actually a dock there where we can pull the boat up. And as you can see, we were living amongst many birds, many birds, many different species of birds. Um, we have sooty terns, we have black-footed albatross, lace and albatross, mast boobies. Um, yeah, the list goes on and on. So Camp on Turn was a little bit more luxurious than our Camp on East, which I will show you in a second. We actually had old structures that remain from when the military inhabited the islands. And so this, uh, the building on the right is an old warehouse. So there's no running water or electricity there, but we could store all, uh, most of our, our gear there and we keep it from uh, exposure from, you know, from rain or sun. We also did pitch a few tents and that is the airstrip. So Term was actually used as an old airport for the military um, for ships traveling between the main Hawaiian islands and Midway. So they would stop here sometimes. Um, but as you can see, the runway is overgrown with shrubbery now. And that is where we pitched our tents. So life on East Island was very minimal. We uh, pitched two different tents and these tents um, you know, were ex like highly exposed to weather. We had very windy days, we had very hot days. So as I said, it was not as luxurious as turn. But we did have um, some wooden plywood, plywood boards that we could lay down and pitch our tent on those. So it gave it more of like a homey feeling and kept the bird ticks from getting in. So there are lots of bird ticks up in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and they are very small. They're not actually um, blood sucking ticks, but they will bite you and they will cause a very itchy bite. So this is a good way to keep those ticks off of us. But oftentimes you have to wear really long pants or socks or something to keep those bugs off of you. So as I mentioned, we did not have electricity or running water. So this meant that we had to dig a long drop. And so a long drop is almost about as tall as a person. And then we reinforced it with some plywood boards and we put a toilet seat over. And then that's not the final product. We did have a privacy tent, <laughs> but you got to imagine you're living with uh, two other researchers for about five months. So you get really close with them. <laughs> and this is Jeff Kuwabara's joke. Let's just say that at the end of the season, this long drop was more of a short drop, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so if we take a peek inside the tent, we can see that on the left hand side, we have a kitchen. In the back, there's a cot bed, and on the right, we have a makeshift desk slash um, food storage area. So we have to kind of compact all of our stuff into a small, confined area. And also, the, the nice thing about working in the field is you're right there in the office. You know, we have our subject matter right in the background. That's me um, tagging a turtle in the background as Jan Willem is entering data from the previous survey. So our daily routine, we would usually wake up around 2 p.m. and eat breakfast. And then around 3 p.m., we would enter data that we collected from the survey the day before. Around 4 p.m., we would begin our basking surveys, which um, included just walking a lap around the island and tagging turtles as well as taking measurements. And then after our basking survey, we would return and we would enter the data. Around 8 p.m., we would eat dinner and then we would begin our night surveys or our nesting surveys at 9 p.m. And so these surveys would last usually until five or six in the morning. Um, so very long nights. And by the end of the season, we definitely became nocturnal. <laughs> and then around 6 a.m., it was bedtime. So here's some other pictures. You can see the picture on the top is um, all the turtles basking on the beach around 4 or 5 p.m. And you can see the white on their shell. Those are actually temporary etchings that we would use um, for easy identification of the turtle. And then we would also put a non-toxic white paint on the shell. And then the bottom picture is a few mating turtles. So they will usually mate in the water column, but then sometimes the females will crawl up on the beach trying to get the male off of her. <laughs> and here's a picture of Mary Lou counting eggs from a nesting sea turtle. And again, we were living among many birds on East Island as well. So a little bit more about our basking surveys. As I, said, we, as I said, we'd start around 4 p.m. and we would walk one lap around the island. And every time we encountered a turtle, we would, if it was a new turtle, we would 
uh, temporarily put a number on that turtle. And then we would try to collect measurements or apply tags depending on what that turtle didn't already have. So um, by the middle of the season, we had put a tag into almost every turtle. And so these surveys would just consist of marking down what turtles we saw. And then you can see the picture on the top left. That is a, um, a turtle containment box. It's temporary. So we would go over the turtle. And then if you can see the bottom right, those are the researchers in the box tagging the turtle. So it just contains the turtle for about five minutes while we apply these tags. And then we'll release the turtle. And sometimes during these basking surveys, the turtles are asleep and they won't even wake up. They won't even know we're there. So every turtle is different, but a lot of times they, um, we go unrecognized. So nesting surveys as well uh, consisted of walking laps around the island. But during a nesting survey, we would walk continuous laps around the island throughout the night. And the top pictures you can see, um, the right is a turtle digging her egg chamber, uh, preparing to nest. And it looks like it's light out, and that's because it is. Some turtles will come up earlier in the evening. So sometimes they'll come up around 7 before the sun is set, and they'll begin nesting early. Uh, like I said, every turtle is different. And then the top left, you can see a, a nest of hatchlings that just emerged, and so they're about to make their way down to the water. So here's a video of a turtle doing what we call chambering, or digging her egg chamber. So this is usually the, um, the second step in nesting. So the turtles will crawl on shore, and then they will build, or they will dig a body pit, which consists of um, the turtle using all four flippers to kind of dig herself down into the sand, and this um, disguises herself. And then she will just use her hind flippers to dig this egg chamber. And it's really cool because her flippers, she kind of uses them almost like hands. You know, they're, they're very efficient with their digging. And finally, when this egg chamber is deep enough, she will um, lay her eggs and then she will cover them. And as you can see, the island is very flat. <laughs> yeah, deep. How deep do they make their egg chamber? Can you guys help me out here with the, it's usually 40 centimeters? Yeah, it's about a foot and a half. A foot and a half, yeah. Sometimes turtles um, that are not as efficient with this digging process will lay in a shallower chamber. And sometimes um, their eggs will be kind of coming out of the chamber. So again, every turtle is different. And maybe the more experienced turtles can dig a deeper egg chamber. But yeah, the average, like you said, about a foot and a half. So another aspect of our work was applying satellite tags. I think I mentioned in that picture earlier, um, we had four satellite tags that we took up there with us and we applied them to nesting female turtles. So this season we are actually satellite tagging some males as well, which is really cool. And the male is on his way back to the main Hawaiian Islands um, as we speak. So from last season, we uh, could track the the migration patterns of these female turtles from their nesting habitat back to the main Hawaiian islands. And so this process um, consists of taking different types of epoxy and gluing the uh, satellite tag onto the shell. And then that blue paint you can see in the top right picture is an anti-fouling paint. So this keeps any barnacles or other marine organisms from growing on the tag and creating drag in the water column. And it's really interesting that all four female turtles that were satellite tagged last season came back to Oahu and they specifically came back to Pearl Harbor. So we believe that um, there is a very popular foraging ground in Pearl Harbor. So it's really cool. They came back here to our, like our island. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a method behind which four you choose to put the tags on? We tried to, um, I'm trying to think. We, so the question was um, if there was a system to how we chose which turtles we would apply these tags to. And we would try to find turtles that had been previously tagged so that we have their history. So from previous seasons, we were doing the same types of tagging. And one of the tags that we apply is the pit tag or a passive integrated transponder. And it's kind of like a microchip that you would put in like a dog or cat. And so with this tag, um, it's a permanent tag and it actually goes into the flesh. And then we, with a, a tag scanner, we can recognize the same turtle. So we would know if this turtle was nesting four years earlier. And so we kind of tried to pick out turtles that we had known history for so that we could continue to get data on that turtle. 
But, um, you know, there's different ways that you can, like you can choose to apply a satellite tag to a new turtle as well, you know, one that you don't know. So it, it really depends on um, what kind of data you want to collect and the scientist. So towards the end of the season, the number of basking turtles rapidly declined because these turtles are migrating back to the main Hawaiian islands because they're done with their nesting season. So at this time, we kind of switched our efforts to nest ex excavations. So every time um, we encountered a known nest or a known emergence of a nest, we would mark that area and then we would wait a couple days and we would go back and excavate the nest. So we give this three day period because we want um, to let natural emergence occur. So there's a, a nest can emerge one night and then the next night um, there may have been some hatchlings that didn't emerge with the initial emergence and so they'll have a second emergence the next night. So we just wanna let that natural process take place but then after three days, we go back in and we carefully dig up the sands. And then we try to count the number of unhatched eggs or the number of um, hatched eggs to see how many hatchlings actually emerge from the nest, as well as sometimes there are live hatchlings that have been stuck under coral rubble or large rocks in the nest. So then um, you can see in the picture on the left, we were able to take these hatchlings down to the beach and let them crawl back into the water. But they were stuck under either like large pieces, uh, large pieces of coral or rock. And then the picture, yeah. uh, incubation period is usually um, on average 65, uh, 60 to 75 days. So we deployed what we call uh, temperature loggers and they're a quarter size device that we would attach to a string. And when we encountered a turtle that was laying her eggs, we would put this device in the, like in the middle of the clutch and then we would have the string trailing to the surface and then we could attach it to something um, such as a rock or some of the marine debris that's around the island like a buoy. And then we would um, document when this clutch was laid and then we would wait the 75 day period and then we would go back and excavate that nest. And we'd also try to watch for an emergence, but it's hard because these emergences happen so quickly. Um, Emerge can a nest within like five minutes and all the hatchings can make it down to the water. So um, we got really great data from these excavations though. And something cool on the top picture, this is an albino hatchling, but it was not fully developed yet. You can kind of see that the, yeah, the head didn't fully develop. But these are the types of things that we would see inside an unhatched egg are um, undeveloped hatchlings or maybe hatchlings that their embryo wasn't fully developed. And we could take samples from these. So as a field biologist, I had the best experience of my life and I was able to go to a place that not many people are able to go to. And I learned so much about all the different species up there. And you also just kind of learn more about yourself when you're working in a remote setting like that. So I hope that I can go back and work as a field biologist again in the future. So do you guys have any questions about life in the field? Yeah. Did you guys witness predation on the baby hatchlings? Yes. So I actually got this question the other day during a presentation um, from a high schooler student, and they were asking about the bird predation because there's so many birds in the atoll. You'd think that um, the the like primary predator would be birds. But actually, I personally did not witness any bird predation on hatchlings, and it hasn't been docu documented in the past. But the main predator that I witnessed was the ghost crabs. So there are lots of ghost crabs up there and they wait in their hole until the hatchlings scurry down to the water line and they'll just sneak out and snatch them up. Yeah, so those are the main predators that I witnessed. Yeah. Um, did you guys see any um, sensors and try on I love that question. So she is asking if we notice high concentrations of turtle nesting, which I am about to talk about here in a second because it's a really good point and it's something that we need to um, further study to understand that. But personally, yes, I did witness other turtles digging up each other's nests. And when this happens, um, sometimes a turtle can dig up a clutch of eggs that has been incubating for maybe say 50 days and those hatchlings are starting to develop already. So um, I witnessed a turtle who dug up another nest and these hatchlings were almost fully developed, but still had a small yolk attached. And unfortunately they didn't survive. So it is common that you will see turtles um, trying to nest in the same area and digging up other nests. 
And it has been documented in the past. I'm not sure about other areas, but I witnessed it personally in French racials. Yes, good question. So is there a difference between the two islands? And in the past, there, haven't, there hasn't been consistent surveying of Turn Island. It's really only been on East Island because that's where it was observed that there was the majority of nesting. So this previous year in 2017, we began continuous surveying on Turn Island as well. And our researchers up there right now are surveying Turn. Um, so what we did this past season that was different from the previous seasons is that we would keep one researcher on Turn Island and that's where the monk seal program was actually stationed. So they had four researchers there. So you wouldn't be alone. You're with them. And then two researchers would be on East Island. And so what we would do is we would do a rotation. So you would spend one week on Turn Island and then two weeks on East and just continue that rotation. So we were all working together, but then we were um, also serving alone on Turn Island. And so we got great data from Turn, but that was really the first season that we've that we had continuous surveying. Yeah. Um, part of my research, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Really good question. Yes. Your, excuse me, your offset schedule then, starting the day at 2 p.m., is that because you need to be out there in the middle of the night because that's when they make their nest right? Yes, exactly. I apologize if I didn't really explain that very well, but the question is um, why did we survey at night? And so green sea turtles here in Hawaii will nest during the nighttime. So some turtles, um, as that one picture, they may come up a little bit earlier or they may stay um, later in the, like the early morning. So sometimes turtles will be out there until 7 a.m. or sometimes they'll come up as early as 6 p.m. in the afternoon. But um, the majority of turtles nest throughout the night. So a turtle can crawl up at 7 p.m. and she can be attempting to nest throughout the night. Um, sometimes turtles will dig a body pit and then decide she doesn't want to nest there and then she'll crawl to a different part of the island and attempt to nest there. Um, so they could be up there all night long. And we actually witnessed turtles that would go between the two islands, trying to nest on turn, deciding she didn't want to, and then she'd go to east the next night and try to nest on East Island. So yeah, lots of um, inner atoll migration. Yes. Um, what, would there be like other predators in the water, like say sharks? Good know? point. That is another very good point. So with the hatchlings, because they're so small, Personally, I didn't witness any shark predation, but do you guys know about the large alua or the tuna? So they will go after the hatchlings and they will patrol the shoreline and right about sunset time, because um, that was when we witnessed the majority of nesting of nests emerging was right around sun, uh, sunset because the temperature is cooling enough where the hatchlings can emerge and go down into the water. So the, the fish have learned to swim right along the shoreline and wait for the hatchlings to go into the water. But luckily there's so many little hatchlings going into the water that the fish can't get all of them. So really good question. I didn't witness any sharks um, eating hatchlings though. Yeah. Is there a time when the turtle hatchlings come out? So like the yeah, the majority. So um, a little bit about hatching biology is they all hatch about the same time and then they work collaboratively to crawl up to the surface of the sand so they'll they'll all kind of um hatch at the same time and they'll crawl up each other and they use each other to get to the surface and then what will happen is say if they make it to the surface of the sand during the daytime um they have this biological instinct that their system will kind of shut down and go into like a sleep stage and they'll wait until the the sand temperature cools so that they can emerge because we did have a lot of times where there were hatchlings that um, attempted to emerge during the day and they would actually um, like overheat and dry up and they can get sunburns on their flippers. So usually we, um, we saw most nests emerging right about sunset or a little bit after around 9 p.m. And it's because that uh, the surface of the sand is starting to cool down. Yeah. How big are the waves then? <laughs> they can get very big, good question. Um, yes, the waves within the atoll, uh, they vary. So sometimes if we had a storm come through, we'd get lots of rain. We'd also have lots of lightning and thunder. And we would have um, very high tides, especially around the full moon, um, called king tides. And so sometimes the tide line, I'll show you some pictures in a second. They'll come all the way up over 
that high tide line and onto the flat part of the island. So, and we were also boating around in these large waves. So, um, but we were safe. Yeah, it was never unsafe, but the waves were really big. Yeah. Um, like you said, there was research happening back in the 1970s. Um, you said there wasn't much like surveying being done, but uh, are they noticing any sort of change in the surface area, like the amount of exposed land from that time till now? Is that a Good question. Or, like, related to the concentration of the turtles too? You know, um, from my knowledge, surveys in the past have shown that there was less nesting female turtles up there. Um, and they, I don't think they had as long of a duration of a season. They would only go out for maybe a few months and we're trying to extend our season so that we can get the entire nesting season as well as doing these nest excavations, which we have to wait until the nests emerge. Um, so personally, I'm not too sure about that, but the, the island was used by the military in the past. And so we're seeing uh, this season, for example, there were some old generators that the military left behind on the islands. And with the, the shifting of the tides and the currents, and the islands actually shift around within the atoll as well, these generators have been exposed. And so now we have four or five generators that just popped up on the island because that sand has been washed away. Yeah. Any other questions? I think a lot of what you guys have been asking, I am going to talk about in a second. That's OK. What's your question? Um, how big is the island? How big is the island? It's not as big as you would think. You can walk across the island in about 10 minutes. So um, it's smaller than a football field. Yeah. But so that's East Island. Turn Island is a little bit bigger. It's big enough where a plane could come and land on the island. So it's very long. I think it's about um, a quarter of a mile long. Have you ever ran a mile? Yeah. <laughs> good questions. Yeah, thank you guys. It's it's really good discussion. So during my time as a field biologist, I um, was doing some independent research that we have been looking into, um, studying the spatial distribution of green sea turtle nests on these two different islands. So this research is very important for the management of the population, and I'll kind of talk about that in a second. So here we have a graph showing the number of female nesters um, since 1973. So as you can see, um, or as I mentioned before, the population was very small and it's been increasing at 6% a year as it's been listed under the Endangered Species Act. So this, we can see this overall increasing trend of female nesters. And then we have a height, oh, sorry, overall increasing trend and then here in 2014, we see the maximum of 889 individual female nesting turtles. So I'm going to put it into perspective, that's a lot of female turtles. In my season in 2017, um, we had about 400. So half that. And then we see here in 2016, we had this really low number of only 88 individual female nesting turtles. But this is an, um, this is a, an annual vari variability that's natural. So sea turtles won't return to the French frigate shoals to nest every season. They have variability. So on average, they return every three to four years to nest. So a turtle that nested this season won't return for three or four years. Yeah. How is such a low count? You know what? Good question. She was asking why we had such a low count that year in 2016. From the researchers that were up there, they said they had very harsh weather conditions. It was very stormy and very overcast for the majority of the season. But if we look in this trend, it could have been that that was just a year where they, like in the past, we haven't had many female turtles nesting. So maybe this is just a natural fluctuation. And we'll see in three more years that we'll have a, a, a very low number like that because it'll be the same individuals returning to nest. So it be multiple different factors. In my mind, that means there's a high number somewhere else. Exactly. And so from this model, we can, we can predict when we'll have a high year. But um, as you can see, it's been increasing. And we don't really know if we're going to keep, keep seeing that increasing trend. So that's why these next couple of years will be very important. But right, we should be expecting a large year soon.
is it predictable as to which island these green turtles are going to be? Because there hasn't there haven't um, hasn't been continuous surveying on Turn Island, we don't really know too much about Turn Island. We're still kind of in this experimental period where this is the second year that we've been doing continuous surveying on Turn Island. But good question. We have lots of data from east, so we're just um, now we can kind of see how the two islands compare, and we'll continue to look into that. Yes. Um, how did this? Um, you had mentioned that initially your survey season was quite short, and now you is that being reflected in numbers? Is it? It more very might be. Um, yes, and. It's hard because we don't always get up there to the French Frigate Shoals at the same time each year because it's very dependent on the ship schedule. So it's definitely a flaw in our data collection, but we're seeing that these turtles will hang around for long enough where if they're there in early April and for my season, we didn't get up there until May, hopefully those turtles are still there. So they, um, turtles can deposit on average four clutches of eggs throughout a season. So they'll nest once and then they'll continue to mate and stay in the area and then they'll return in two weeks and lay another clutch of eggs. And so it, on average, they return every two weeks to lay a clutch of eggs. And then when they're all done, they'll return to the main Hawaiian Islands. So you would think that you, over that period of time, you would see the majority of the turtles. Yes. Uh, yeah. Just for that, that question. So this graph here is accounted for effort. So this is normalized. And so for years where we didn't go for a whole season, you base that on the effort and you estimate the total for the year. In more recent years, saturation and tagging year, the estimate, estimate is what was counted. But for this graph, if you can compare years. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Yes. You're tracking some of these turtles and they're wandering around. Could they possibly be nesting somewhere else as well? Yes, good question. So he's I'm asking going, if. I'm going to yeah, so. There are eight sandy islands within the atoll, and there have been um, observed, uh, like, when the turtle body pits, she'll leave a large pit in the sand, and she'll leave her tracks as well. And so we have seen this on the other islands, but we haven't done surveying on these other islands. They're, they're very small, and they, they can't really support a camp there, so we usually don't camp there to survey those areas, but the 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 turtle crawls and pits that we're seeing on those islands are so minimal that we don't really survey those areas. But they could be um, migrating throughout the atoll and from the satellite tags that we've deployed, we have seen them um, basking during the day on other islands within the atoll and then nesting, like basking on one of the other islands and then coming back to either turn or east to nest. Yeah. Yes, great question. Both males and females bask. And uh, we do see that the males leave the atoll on average earlier than the females do because the females will stay around to nest longer and the males are really just there for mating. Any more questions? Okay. So a previous study estimated that East Island is well below carrying capacity, meaning that it can support more female turtles nesting within a season. So, however, this study was based on the assumption that turtles distribute their nests randomly. And it, they were taking into account that the turtles are nesting all over the island. But other studies have shown that there is a relationship between these environmental factors and where a turtle will choose to nest. So we are thinking that these environmental factors may be a driving for where the turtles are nesting. And this may lead to a different type of spatial distribution. So as we've seen, we've seen this increase in the nesting trend. But if we are having an increasing population and all of these turtles are wanting to nest in the same area, we're wondering, will this trend continue to increase? And so the purpose of our study was to examine the spatial distribution patterns of nesting turtles on these two islands. And based off findings from previous studies, it was predicted that environmental factors could be one of these um, driving factors to this different type of spatial distribution. And so it was expected that we would see a cluster distribution of nests. As, some, um, as you mentioned earlier, with turtles digging up each other's nests, they seem to want to nest in similar areas. 
So we're expecting to see this clustering pattern of nests, and this would have implications for carrying capacity. So I already kind of mentioned this earlier, um, but part of our uh, data collection was these nesting surveys. And then every time we encountered a turtle that was actively laying eggs, we would take a GPS coordinates. And then we would um, we use these waypoints to put them into our database using Microsoft Access, and then we export them onto an Excel sheet. And then we were able to plot these points on maps made from Google Earth. And then these maps were geo-referenced um, and the points were projected onto the maps and then using a UTM of 3N. So this helps make it on more of a fine scale so that we can calculate these nests to the, the scale of meters squared. So we can see, we can really find scale where these nests are located. So the spatial pattern was analyzed in um, a software called ArcGIS. And so this um, was called Average Nearest Neighbor. And so this tool allowed us to calculate the type of spatial distribution, whether it was clustered, random, or uniform, and then whether or not it was statistically significant. We also use the kernel density estimate, and this takes those points and it calculates a, a smooth surface from the nests, and then it gives us the outputs of nest per meter square. And then from this, we can calculate what are called the 95 and 50% volume contours. And so these are just showing that 95% of those points are located within this percentage of the area of the entire island. So it kind of shows us where the majority of turtles are nesting. And I can give you an example of that later. So our results. We use the average nearest neighbor to calculate the z-score of negative 17. And if we see that blue square beside it, we look over here and we see that that gives us a critical value um, below negative 2.58. And so that shows that on this graph, it is statistically significant. So on the left side of the graph in the blue, we have a significant um, value that is clustered, as we can see here. And then in the middle, we have that yellow that is not significant and it's just random. And then on the right, we have another significant value that would um, lead to us thinking that there is a uniform distribution, so they're evenly spread out. So you can see here from the points on the map, it looks like it may be distributed at random, but using these, these tools, we could calculate that it is statistically significant and clumped. And so we were able to use the kernel density estimate to visualize these hotspots and calculate um, where these turtles are nesting. So you can see the areas in the red are where we have higher densities of turtle nests. And then with kernel density estimate, we could use the 95 and 50% volume contours and so you can see um, the outline in black is the 95. So that shows that 95% of nests were located within that area. And then you can see the red lines show where 50% of the nests were located. And so 95% of nests were located within 35% of the islands. And 50% of the nests were located within just 10% of the islands. So we can see here this clustering pattern. On Turn Island as well, it was statistically significant and clustered. So here we have Turn Island, and this is a, a zoomed in uh, photo of the map, but we can see the nests are scattered mostly along that south side of the island. And even though they may look randomly distributed, they are clustered as well. So here we use a kernel density estimate to visualize those hotspots. And then using the kernel density, we also see 5% volume contours as well as the 50% volume contours. And it was calculated that 95% of these nests are located within just 8% of the total islands. And that 50% of these nests are within only 2% of the island. That's a very small percentage. So you may have looked at these maps and thought that it looks like there's um, other suitable nesting habitat that these turtles are not utilizing. But what you can't see from an aerial view of the map that I saw during my nesting is um, certain areas such as this spit on the northwestern side of the island is very low lying and is constantly shifting. So 
wave action and currents are shifting this um, uh, spit of sand throughout the nesting season. So it's not very suitable nesting habitat because nests here would be washed out or inundated with water. We can also look down here on the northeastern side of the island and it looks like suitable nesting habitat from an aerial view. But this, was, uh, this area was known for having a very steep berm and turtles would struggle to climb up onto the island on that side so they wouldn't really nest in that area. And as well as in the middle here, you may see that darker patch, you may be wondering what that is. That is a high density of vegetation and bird nesting. And so there could possibly be competition between different species, um, both animals and plants. So we saw many different bird species nesting there, such as the mast boobies, which are the white ones, and then um, some albatross as well, and shearwaters, which actually burrow. So their nests are scattered throughout the ground. And so if a turtle is crawling over those nests, they may collapse the nest. Um, so we didn't see high nesting over there as well. So for Turn Island, it's a little bit different because of all the man-made features here. So as we can see on the beach towards the northern side of the island, right there, we can see there's two nests there. But this beach was very narrow, and it also had um, barriers on both sides of the beach. So these barriers were either rocks or actually metal seawalls that kept the turtles from um, having a larger area to come on land and nest. We see this area over here on the east side of the island, and again, there's two nests there. But this area was known for tidal inundation. So as you can see here in the picture, this is a, a sand spit and waves would constantly wash over the entire sand spit and this would inundate the eggs and um, lead to lower hatching su success. And here we see the majority of nesting on the South Beach. And you may think that all the nests here, you know, this is where the majority of turtles are choosing to nest. But we're wondering, are these nests successful? And there's other factors that are affecting the turtles in this area. So as I said, term was used for the military. So there's remnant structures that are still left behind, such as old water towers in the background. There's, it's scattered with pipes and um, barbed poles. It's, it's like a death trap. And it also often leads to entrapment hazards. And this is actually a turtle that was up nesting one season and became entrapped in a large cement crack and actually died because of it. And so it is, it is directly affecting female nesting turtles. And then we can also see that this beach is very long, but it's also very narrow. And these um, large tide fluctuations um, can actually come up over the, like the high tide line, up over the berm and into the vegetation. And this would also lead to inundation of nests and lower hatching success. So we have these different environmental factors, such as physical, um, the ones mentioned, shifting sands, the different berm features, inundation, narrow beaches. And we also have biological factors, such as competition with other species, like I mentioned, the birds and plants. And when you have a lot of different species living together, it can lead to higher microbial activity. So, um, you know, if you have animals that are excreting waste or if they're dead animals, this will all lead to higher um, bacteria in the area and that could also lead to lower hatching success. But then we also have anthropogenic causes. So as I mentioned, all the structures that were left behind from the military and have not been removed that are causing hazards for the animals and also leading to um, less area to nest. So all of these can affect where a turtle is choosing to put her nest or where these nests are located. And then this can directly impact hatching success. And so from these, um, we can, further studies are needed to see how these all correlate or the relations, but we can see that these are affecting where the turtles are nesting. So our study did determine that there is a cluster pattern or distribution of nests on both Turn and East Islands. And using the, the kernel density estimate, we were able to determine that 50% of these nests are located in very small percentages of the entire island. So previous studies, um, as I mentioned before, show that the islands can, or that at least East Island can still support a larger population of nesting female turtles, but they didn't really take into account the spatial distribution of these nests. So, 
it would be great to further assess this issue and um, these implications of the different spatial distributions may lead to a decrease in carrying capacity of the population. So I'd like to thank everybody for all their help. Um, my uh, fellow field reachers, Mary Lou and Jan Willem, who stayed with me for months in the field, as well as um, the Marine Turtle Biology and Assessment Program. Dr. T. Todd Jones, our, the lead of our program, who is in the back, as well as Cameron Allen, who is a great scientist doing great research, as well as everybody else within our program. And also my mentors at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, Dr. Cynthia Hunter and Jeff Kuwabara, for providing me this great opportunity to get myself involved in turtle research. So I, here's a little PSA. We have um, a citizen scientist project going on right now. So as I was saying, these turtles are being temporarily etched in the field, and then they'll be returning here to the main Hawaiian islands. And we'll start to see them in these near shore environments. If you're at the beach, maybe these turtles will be basking. Maybe they'll be um, foraging while you're snorkeling. So if you're out and you see a turtle that is numbered, we ask that you please keep a respectful distance and try to take a photo if possible and record the location you saw the turtle. And then you can email all this information to respectwildlife at noaa.gov. And then you can also um, feel free to post your photos to social media and use that hashtag HonuCount2018. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight. And I loved all your great questions. Um, do you guys have any questions for me? One more. Yes, of course. On both islands, if the pond is the nest, we're on the south. Any hypothesis that why that would be? Great observation. I do not have any hypotheses at the time but I think it is something that we really need to look into. Um, from my experience being out there, I noticed that the south side of the island was more protected, especially on East Island. Um, that southwestern side was protected by a, a very shallow coral reef and the beach doesn't tend to be as steep there. So that may be a possible factor. Yes. Is Turn Island a reclaimed man-made island? Yes, it is. So I. I don't know the exact history, but I do know it was man-made and initially used by the military. And then U.S. Fish and Wildlife used it for research as well. So, um, yeah, there remain many structures on the island. We still work kind of like we have Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yep, good observation. That is another factor. Um, and previous studies have mentioned, or they've taken into account sea level rise, but it's um, not many studies have been done to relate that to uh, sea turtle nesting here in Hawaii. Yes. If that island is man-made, where do you think all these turtles would go if it wasn't made? Very good point. And because there haven't been continuous surveys conducted on Turn Island, we really don't know how long or how many turtles have been nesting there. So we're hoping that if we can continue to survey Turn Island, we can see a trend and maybe we'll see an increase in nesting turtles there because they're realizing that here's this habitat where turtles may have been nesting on East Island for many, many years. Yeah, good point. Yes. If there's an increasing um, volume of like uh, female turtles, what will happen if that's already taken up? What will the other turtles do? Like what will they you know. do? Will they get nest? You should become a scientist and you should figure that out because that is a great question. And that's part of our research right now. We're trying to see what factors may be driving these turtles to nest in these certain areas. Um, and as somebody mentioned earlier, sometimes turtles will actually come and they'll try to dig their nest where a nest is already laid. And so then they'll just dig up the, that other turtle's nest and then those eggs won't hatch. So yeah, very good point. Yes. <laughs> it's buried down so deep that they can't even see it. Yeah, they don't know. Maybe they should tell each other, right? 